KGW is presenting Friday, October 12th, just as it was. Now this is a recreation of the windstorm which lashed the Pacific Northwest one week ago this evening. Repeating, this is a recreation of those events. The city, in the absence of Mayor Terry Shrunk, was under the leadership of Commissioner Bill Bowes. Well, what actually happened was that I was on my way home when this thing actually hit and I realized the significance of it. I immediately uh, put in some calls to the chief of police and to the city attorney, the city engineer, and the chief of the fire bureau to assemble in the chief's office where we set up a temporary strategy committee to evaluate what was happening. At the command post, I would say, through transistor radios, we were aware of what KGW was doing at all times, and I certainly want to express my appreciation to the staff and the management of KGW for doing what I term a yeoman service to the public. <laughs> In the state capital at Salem, a city to join countless others in the ravages and destruction of the winds of Frida, Governor Mark Hatfield had established a command post with the National Guard, Civil Defense, and Oregon State Police. The key problem in any such crisis as this is, of course, the problem of communications. And the command position, or command post, which we might call it, that was set up in my office in the Capitol building, was an effort to establish communication in order to know what the needs of the people and the communities throughout this state were. We had uh, radio, and I might say the only radio was KGW, uh, as a listening post for our communication system. I had a monitor for the state police radio system. We had a uh, system of the uh, National Guard, we had a radio system of the civil defense. In other words, we had all these radio networks put together to try to piece a communication system up for the entire state. All right, we've just received some emergency information from the southwest Portland area. Apparently power is out to one of the pumps in the area, uh, water pumps, and there seems to be a 24-hour supply of water in the southwest Portland areas. Now, this includes, of course, Cedar Hills and Beaverton, too, on water districts throughout that area. Frank, do uh, you have some information here? I noticed one of the gals just, what is that? Uh, Troutdale Airport uh, has suffered quite a bit of damage, we are uh, reported. The roof and the north wall gave away. Some, uh, some planes out there are totaled out at Troutdale Airport. And here's one. Uh, especially now that the wind has died down a little bit, we have some sightseers. For heaven's sakes, stay home. It is still not safe. This storm, although it has abated somewhat, we are still expecting strong gusts. And here is word from the Jansen Beach Moorage. Stay away. It's exceptionally hazardous due to the eastern wings of Moorage torn away. And much metal flying around. That's at the Jansen Beach Moorage area. So be extremely careful and please do not do any sightseeing. <laughs> Carson's family was to suffer, as were countless others. He described it in this way. The roof, actually, it was uh, it was one of these uh, high-level type deals with a front porch that hangs out, you know, quite a ways. Out, out over a walk across the front, you know. And that thing uh, started oscillating, it ripped loose, started oscillating, and in, in, in turn reached up and reached the hip of the other roof, and, and away it went, the whole thing. And the family was all inside? They were inside when it happened. They said it was quite a yell, uh, quite a, a lot of racket. And uh, the, the insulation that was in the roof, you know, above, this pottered, not pottered, but this flaky stuff. Uh, the other neighbors saw that when it happened, thought it was smoke, and they all came running. So the, the family was well taken, you know, right away. There's people there. And in the family car with her husband, Janelle Hess, who bore her first child Tuesday of this week was trying to get home last Friday night. We started out was going after groceries Friday night, and we went up Skyline, and we went up past the Skyline Memorial Gardens, and we were sure our car was tipped on two wheels at one time, and we got so just, well, maybe half a mile further, and we went under lines of all sorts, and one wrapped around our car, and then we decided there was too many trees across the road, we couldn't go under them, so we turned around and went back, and there was one back there too, so we had to sit in the middle of the road from 6.30 till about 11 that night. And we were sitting there, and there's another car with us. And he was real scared. He was a salesman, and he didn't know where he was. 
and we were just sat sitting there and some man came from behind us with a flashlight and he went on further and got a buzz saw and sawed us out. Along Portland's waterfront and throughout the sweep of the mighty Columbia, the winds churned docks and houseboats loose from their moorings. On the Hawthorne Bridge, tender Wesley Carnes faced the crisis just as it happened. And I finally crawled out onto the porch there in the operating room and I saw the ship tower in the middle of the draw. And I couldn't figure out for a few seconds I thought it was two ships in there from up above the river. I couldn't see a thing before it happened at all. The thing was dark, and I never saw no ship coming at all. And there was three fellers in the east waiting room that got smashed to pieces. They'd been there for an hour and a half awaiting the wind to subside, but it didn't, so they finally took off and went west and wasn't 15 minutes after that to the ship hit the waiting room and was demolished so they were living right at first uh, just a little while before that we had just mentioned that uh, we hoped that none of the ships from Zydell's would break loose and sure enough it did I'd like to point out again that as uh, you were reminded a while back by KGW manager Pat Crafton please do not visit hospitals uh, or uh, Individuals in hospitals that, um, you know, friends of the family and whatnot, they're all right. Uh, and their condition is good. You cannot help them. Here's a notice just brought in a hotline down on Northeast 60th, a block north of Killingsworth. Frank, what do you have there? There's another line down at 20th and Hawthorne, also a report that the Oregon Yacht Club at Willamette has been demolished. As far as the traffic situation goes, we are still trying to fill in. It is very bad downtown. We're also trying to get in touch with Physicians and Surgeons Hospital to check on that situation there, if possible. The first casualty was a late laceration from windows broken downtown and was immediately sent to the emergency room. And as we had no lights whatsoever and the auxiliary had failed at that particular moment, the operation was done by flashlight with the aid of nurses and two doctors. About 7.15 we received from the fire department our first auxiliary power plant, which we operated out of the emergency room and into the, some of the halls and to the first floor. This gave us fairly temporary lights while we were operating with flashlights, candles, and railroad lanterns. Being our lights did not come on until approximately 9.15 Saturday morning with the help of St. Vincent's Hospital, cooked our breakfast for our patients, which then amounted over to 100 patients. The mush, or cereal, the toast, and uh, soft-cooked eggs were prepared at St. Vincent's. The coffee was sent in from Manning's downtown, and the patients were served, and I talked to two or three patients, and they said everything was great, it was good, the eggs were warm, the mush was warm, we had a little problem with cold toast, but I think we've all eaten cold toast at home in our lives, more or less. One hospital in the terror of Frida, and there were many. Some had auxiliary power, many did not, at least not at first. In the nation's capital, Congress was still in session, and there were many who presumed it might be tied up for some long time. Congressman Walter Norblad was at his desk in congressional chambers. Well, I came home uh, when I got back to my house there in the Washington area that night about 11. I called out to talk to my wife about a certain matter and couldn't get her. And I talked to a neighbor, and he was the one who told me about it. And I asked, pressed him, of course, for further details, particularly he told me my house was down. And he said that the only news he or anybody else in the entire area was getting were from, was from KGW. It was the only station on the air. And he repeated what you people were broadcasting at the time. And did you hear any reports uh, in Washington, D.C. itself, sir? Well, I immediately turned on the radio at the 11 o'clock full half-hour news, and there was no news about it at that time, but I kept it on at about, oh, 12.30, 1 o'clock Washington time, I guess I had on WRC, which is a big major, uh, one of the network outlets there, and they piped in KGW. They said KGW was the only station that was operating, and they had a direct report from KGW, which is broadcast, so that's when I got my the bulk of my news about it. As I say, it was about 1 o'clock in the morning from your station. 
By early morning, uh, shortly after 1 a.m., we waited for the last and latest weather forecast from KGW's Jack Capel. This is the most encouraging report we've had. The winds are beginning to drop very definitely to the south of us. They've already dropped to around 10 with gusts to 20 here in the Portland area. Up to the north, the wind is still quite violent. Uh, Bellingham reporting gusts up to 92 miles an hour. But here are, at any rate, some of the wind reports as of uh, uh, 1 o'clock this morning at various places around the northwest. Portland. 10 miles an hour with gusts to 20. Hoquiam, south-southwest, 32 miles an hour. North Bend, on the Oregon coast, south 14 with gusts to 23. Crescent City, California, south-southeast, 17 with gusts to 23. Seattle, Washington, south-southwest, 35 with gusts to 45. Boeing Field, gusts to 45 also in Seattle. Eugene now, southeast, 10 miles an hour. And Bellingham, as we said, gusts up to 92 miles an hour. The Victoria area area now has gusts uh, winds from the east 56 miles an hour and the gusts are not reported we would expect that they would have considerable wind up in that area right now but definitely the winds have dropped over Oregon and there's no sign of any recurrence it looks as though the big wind storm of this Friday night is finally passing to the north well thank you very much Jack Capel and that just about sums it up here from KGW radio the time right now at about 19 minutes past 1 a.m. on a Saturday morning, and it's uh, Saturday the 13th. And with that encouraging report, Jack, I think we'll wrap it up here for our emergency service. Our uh, candles are burning low, and the Coleman Lantern is still going. And as we wrap it up here, one final reminder that the uh, scented candle shop on North Lombard in Portland will be open all night tonight. This is KGW Radio 620, first on the dial in Portland, operating on an assigned frequency of 620. Ladies and gentlemen, KGW Radio's manager, Mr. Pat Crafton. This has been the story of October 12, just as it was. A destructive blow of nature which brought with it death, injury, damage, and a rude change of existence for thousands and thousands of us in Oregon and Washington. The loss of 21 lives was tragic indeed, but it could have been many times worse had it not been for warnings and advice given by responsible officials and a responsive citizenry which remained calm in the face of potential panic. Many lives were most certainly saved by the help which came through that instantaneous and reliable marvel of communication, radio. What was done by radio that Friday night of October 12 and the following days of recovery was what you have every right to expect of us. But there are lessons to be learned for the future. No transmitter can be of value to you unless you have a receiver to remain in touch with your fellow human beings, to know what is going on and where your help is needed, to aid those less fortunate than yourselves, or merely to follow instructions and thereby minimize confusion and tragedy. The role of the portable transistor radio receiver certainly became an extremely important one. It became the link to reassurance and vital information. Certainly now it should be apparent to all that no family or single individual should be without a transistor in working order. Similarly, the radios in our cars must be kept in working order because many of us will again be caught on the road. In time of need, radio will be there again to give immediate help when you need it but you must be able to listen if radio is to work for you. Now, I would like to express our heartfelt appreciation to all of you who helped us at KGW. The many public officials, the police and fire departments throughout our listening area, the ham radio operators and many others too numerous to name. But particularly we want to thank you, our listeners, who were tuned to KGW the night of the terrible 12th. Thank you for helping us and thank you for your many heartwarming letters and calls which have poured into the station these past few days. It has been our privilege to serve you. Thank you and good night from all of us at KGW Radio.